Please go ahead. So this was one of my questions, but it got put into with um, my my colleague. But um, I was wondering if you could share with us the plans for the Dora Kennedy School, like just like what's going on. We we have um, we sent a letter to you a, a while back, and and we just would like to know what the status is today. Sure. Thank you so much for that question. Um, so as you know, we've had. Um, uh, I want to say four engagements with the Dora Kennedy community uh, within the last uh, month uh, where I had an opportunity to meet with not only the principals, the PTAs, the PTA, uh, executive board, and then the full, uh, in a full town hall format, the community. Uh, the initial plan that was uh, uh, introduced to Dora Kennedy was to move as a permanent swing or a permanent placement to Kenmore Middle School. Uh, in the Landover area, uh, that was met with real resistance um, um, uh, to a degree that, um, you know, w it, it, it encouraged us to revisit that plan uh, and to take into account the feedback that we'd received from the community. So we did just that. Uh, at the last town hall meeting that was, I want to say, a week ago or a week and a half, uh, we shared an alternative option. Uh, that is being vetted now uh, for instead of moving to Kenmore Middle School, that the permanent placement for the Dora Kennedy French Immersion Program would be co-location at Robert Goddard Montessori School, mm. uh, which is where the school was located about 15, 14, 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, and so uh, we did share uh, the specifics around that possibility at that town hall meeting. Uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, we took feedback from the community in that session. Uh, we actually uh, shifted from presenting to just kind of listening. Uh, we wanted to hear their feedback uh, with respect to uh, what their reactions were to that as a possibility. Uh, we also pointed out the uh, major renovations that were recently completed at the Robert Goddard uh, facility. We talked about uh, plans that we were uh, uh, moving forward with expanding the capacity of that facility to house students. Uh, and so that's where it sits. Uh, we are still looking at that as a draft possibility. Uh, we are working through the many different specifics uh, related to that because it would require us to uh, swing the Hyattsville Elementary <laughs> School community to uh, another location, St. Mark's Church, which is close to um, uh, Northwestern High School and in the shadow of nice. University of Maryland. Uh, we've used that site. I think you all are familiar with it. That's where Cherokee Lane was located for a year. Uh, so we know it is a viable location for a, one of our school communities. Um, so we're working through the process uh, with the archdiocese to, to determine if that is something that we can uh, solidify uh, once that is taken care of, uh, uh, then we'll feel more confident uh, that we can take this from a draft plan to an actual plan. And so that's pretty much where we are. Uh, we shared this, this updated uh, uh, swing plan uh, with the uh, Dora Kennedy community, and we actually shared it with the Hyattsville Elementary School community as well, uh, because we want everyone to be aware of, what, of the pivot uh, that we're looking to make. Uh, but we will certainly inform uh, the community once we have been, we feel confident that all those steps, the variables that are, are uh, needed uh, uh, before we can solidify it, we'll, we will notify the community once that's done. Thank you for listening to the community. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any, uh, can you scroll down a little bit? Let, let pipes and safe water in school. Who's going to take it? Uh, Mr. Hill, please. Um, thank you. So why uh, hasn't the uh, lead pipes issue at the uh, Prince George's uh, schools been addressed, especially Hollywood Elementary School? Uh, given that these older schools, are there concerns for uh, lead in, or other contaminants? Um, what are the plans for active maintenance to avoid having the entirety uh, shut down, uh, water system shut down in the future, such as what has happened at Hollywood Elementary School. Thank you. Who's going to take it? Thank you for that. So this, this, that's a complex question. We certainly do appreciate it. I think we are going to need to have 
kind of multiple responses. Uh, one that's gonna talk about the state of our infrastructure, another that talks about um, kind of how we mitigate and provide quality drinking water for our staff and students uh, when, we don't, uh, when we don't have confidence uh, that the piping can provide it. Uh, so why don't we start with um, Director Matlock uh, to talk about um, our infrastructure management piece. So what we try to do, so most of our buildings are over 50 years old. Uh, most of them uh, have lead pipe in the buildings. Um, what we're trying to do is we the first thing we're doing is we're in our new schools, of course they're gonna need piping. Uh, if we're having a major replacement school, then they get new piping. And if we do stage renovations, uh, then they get new piping. But the reason why we don't do it in all the schools is that once you start that work, it triggers a number of things in the building code requirements and then we have to make major upgrades to the building that have nothing to do with piping or water or anything else. And it's just, it's too expensive to do it in, in one throw. And then in a lot of cases, the work is so extensive, you'd have to swing, that is move a school to another location in order to do all that work in a, in a reasonable amount of time. And, and that's difficult to do as well since we don't really have very much swing space left. So, and, and what, we're, what we're doing is, again, it's replacement schools are getting them, new schools are getting them, and then major renovations, when we go in and do a major renovation, then we upgrade the piping. Otherwise, um, we just do the environmental mitigations, which um, Mr. Baylor can talk about. So, is there no possibilities of installing filtration Uh, yes, th there is possibility of uh, doing filtration, but we, we really don't want to go that route because it is a super expensive endeavor. Um, if anyone here has a filter within their uh, refrigerator, you know how much that costs. And if you think about how many fountains we have throughout the system, it would be, an, it would be a financial burden to attempt to do. Um, other school have, systems have attempted and the financial burden is, is great. So we're trying you know, not to go to that extent of filtering everything. Um, <clears throat> I wanna start with um, all of our schools water systems were shut down because of COVID. It, they weren't shut down because of lead or anything else. They were shut down because of COVID. And as we came back, we started to turn things on. And because of the Comar regulation, we were in our three year cycle to begin to test again. And so th once we started doing that, we found some issues and some problems and we turned anything that was above the state of Maryland action level, we turned it off until we could repair the bubbler or replace the bubbler and then we're going to resample. So, and everyone has bottled water until that happens, until we're sh ensured that we have enough potable drinking water fountains within our schools for our, for our children. So no school will go without at least bottled water. Now we have put at least one filtered, bottle filled one, uh, water station in every single one of our schools. So we, we usually put it either in the front door area or multi-purpose room or high traffic areas. If we have like a high school with auditorium or gym, it's usually where we stick those bottle filled, uh, filtered water stations. We have a phase three where we're going to do some additional, but we do not want to go the route of filtering uh, entire buildings. It, it's just a well, it's super uh, duper expensive uh, endeavor. Filtering the whole building may not be necessary. It's the water fountains and the cafeteria kitchen. Yeah, we're not talking the whole building because you know toilets and sinks don't need filtration. No, we, we, would, we wouldn't, only drinkable fountains would is what would ever even be thought of uh, to filter. We would never filter sinks or toilets or anything like that. Uh, it's just a, it's, it's a lot when you start talking about a school system our size. There are a lot of plastic water bottles being used. Yes, it is. And it's creating litters and an environmental disaster. So I, I don't understand why other counties can address this and not our county. No, we are addressing it. We, we're definitely addressing it. And we're moving actually away from the bottles 
to the five gallon uh, drinking water stations within the schools away from the singular bottles until you, we get everything addressed do you know when, fixed. Do you know when Hollywood will be getting those five gallon water system? Um, not right here in front of me, but we can say within the next week or two. Okay. This, uh, I, I, I think, yeah. I believe this, uh, this system is going on for, I even before COVID, I mean, Absolutely. for a while. And, and he, from a maintenance standpoint, um, you know, this is something that you and I didn't cause. This was done 30 years, 40 years ago. Um, the issue we have now is we went in and we put one drinking fountain in every school. And when we did that, we opened up the walls, but the pipes are so old that it's tough to find a good piece of pipe to reconnect to once we start doing that plumbing. And you end up having to go two, 300 feet to, before you can find a, find a piece of pipe that you can reconnect to. New, so it becomes very expensive. Sometimes it's $1,500 to put that sink in. Sometimes it's $8,000. It really depends on the, the structure of the, the aging facility. There's a lot of um, things that go into this, but we are spending, I believe our budget is $200,000 a year, and we're chipping away at it. But in the meantime, what Mr. Baylor is responsible for is make sure the kids are safe. And I understand about the drinking, the, the bottled water and, and the plastic bottles. I would like to get rid of them, but our responsibility is to make sure the kids are safe first. And once we do that, then we, uh, then we will do what we can to reduce the, uh, the use of those bottles. But we have a recycling program, a very vigorous recycling program to recycle those bottles. Every one of our schools has a, has a single stream recycling, and we are and, and we're moving to composting. We, we're doing a lot for the environment, but in the meantime, we cannot stop using the bottled water. The, I, we have to make sure the kids are safe first. And I apologize for the amount of water we use, but that's just the, the nature of, of where we are. We have to make sure the kids are safe until we can get through. And like I said, I, with a budget of $200,000 a year, it's going to take a long time to fix this problem. It really is. Mm -hmm. Any follow-up questions on water? Lead? Okay. Uh, I think we talked a lot about the maintenance uh, in previous questions, so I'm just going to kind of just take a step back uh, and approach this a little more strategically. Does the current budget process allow for, for effective planning for some of those major renovations? And I, I ask that because you said 200000 uh, is your guys' budget. Uh, I'm not good with numbers, but I'm pretty sure it's not a lot of money. Uh, so to, to do those Excuse me, $200,000 is our budget for lead remediation. For lead remediation. Just lead remediation. I'm concerned about Hollywood. Yeah. Hollywood's in our school. It's <laughs> part of a bigger plan. <laughs> uh, ho uh, Hollywood Elementary, obviously, we've, we've, all, we've all shared our concerns. Uh, it's, it's been under, uh, I guess, just constant review. Uh, do you need more money? Is it a timing situation? I would love to try to fix this problem, whether if it's not me, it's the next council, but like help us understand what you all need to, to make that happen. Do you need us to advocate to someone? So when I took over, I, I'm no longer director of capital programs, but I was for about six years. I just recently transitioned. And when I took the job, um, I was told that we did a study, we did multiple studies, we did three separate um, facilities evaluations that were done by outside groups, not internally, uh, and the, the, what they concluded was in order to modernize our portfolio of schools, we need to spend roughly about $8.5 billion over 20 years. So I said, oh great, because I was first, that was the first thing I saw, I said I'm getting $425 million a year. Uh, no, you're not. So I said, well, how much do I got? And they said, well, you, you get about somewhere between 120, 160. And then about 40% of that goes to just stabilization, maintenance stabilization that we do projects to just keep things going, you know. It's 200 schools. And, and, and I can't stress that more. It's 200 schools. So one of the things that we're trying to do, as you can see through our modernization plan, if you look at our educational facilities master plan, which is online, uh, the first thing we're trying to do is in places where it's possible, where it makes sense, we're trying to consolidate schools so that we reduce the number of school buildings that we have to do, um, that we have to maintain. So the idea is to make the, the inventory a little smaller, build some bigger schools,
but make the inventory itself smaller so we can advocate do more in, in that regard. The other thing you have to understand is it used to be we used to do these little projects. You do a little bit here, you do a little bit there. So you do a piping system into an old HVAC system and it ruins the HVAC system. Mm -hmm. Or you try to use a new system with the old piping and it crumbles. And then you have to go back in and do that. So we stop doing that. What we now do is more what I would call um, holistic projects. Um, which if we do an HVAC system, we swing the school, um, we do the windows, we do the roof, we do the piping, we do the HVAC system, put a new boiler in, with new flooring, new lighting, and whatever else we need to do that's required, that's needed to do while the walls are open, plus we do ADA upgrades and we do a, a fire alarm. You can imagine that's not an inexpensive process, but it's the only way to really address a building when you have those kind of problems. So between doing small projects, which Sam's team handles, and some of my people handle, um, to keep the buildings going, um, that is, replacing uh, systems in kind where it's possible, um, and doing those sorts of things, uh, we're also trying to, to either renovate or replace. And when we do renovate or replace, it, like it requires a, um, a swing, uh, moving the students around, and we only have about four or five buildings that we can do that with. And that's throughout the entire county. And so that's not easy to do. Um, and so we're, we're constantly trying to make uh, moves to make that possible. In cases like Dora Kennedy, which was in the question, that's not going to be a temporary move. When we move them, that will be a permanent move. Um, we'll then use their space as a swing space temporarily, and then we will do something else with the building. But it's too expensive to maintain that building in its current condition. There's just some of the equipment is so old in there that you actually have to send out and have it machined, parts machined, in order to keep the, the in order to replace parts. You can't buy them. So those are the types of things we're trying to make sure that we're we're focusing our money on things that can be fixed. And when they can't, then we're we're shifting away from them and trying to consolidate in other locations. Thank you. Um, can I take a follow-up question from Mayor Pratam? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And this, and this is not a statement to put you under the bus or I got you, whatever. You mean the school bus? Not the school <laughs> bus. <laughs> not, I'm not trying to, but I hear that 82% of the county's budget, I could be wrong, is dedicated to the schools, Board of Education funding. So going to my colleague's question, Councilman Hernandez, it's frustrating as we sit here on the dais and we hear our parents with their children in their schools that are old schools with old pipes and 82% of the budget, and yet we're still at the same junction where we are right now. So I'm, I'm saying this in a way that, again, talk about collaboration. People forget about the local elected officials that we can help support the voice and messaging. So how do we support you to articulate the messaging? Because well, that's it's important. It's important to understand that all the budgets are different. So capital budget is a slice of the overall budget, mm -hmm. right? The bud and so our, as I said before, our budget is roughly of that, it, maybe we're like 1% or something like that of the total budget. And we're funded differently. We don't come out of the operating budget at all. So the money, the vast majority of the money you're talking about is actually in the classrooms. We're talking teachers, materials, equipment, Chromebooks for one-to-one, -one, uh, tutoring, uh, the international office, all the other uh, round surrounding services, mental health services, all those things. That's what that funds. When they go out and sell bonds for capital programs for the county, that's where we are. And that requires them to actually go into debt with a bond sale that then has to be used over time. That's a different bucket of money that comes out. And they handle that differently. And so they, they can only give us so much out of that bucket for capital expenditures. And it's, you know, there's some, there, how it's used. It. And so the county itself has done some things. So one of the things they did was, well, the pro program I run is the, the um, public-private partnership programs, right? And that's helped us accelerate some construction by using a little bit of money from the operating, a little bit of here, to pay an availability payment 
for construction of schools. And that's been very helpful. It allowed us to build six new schools very quickly. We're working on eight more, which will be done very quickly. And then the other thing behind that is um, they, they've been able to leverage some money from the state that we would not otherwise have gotten because of it. So there are a lot of things that, are, that they're trying to do. We're working with the county government to try and figure out more and more creative ways in order to use the money and, and to get the money. But the reality is that um, there's only so much um, water in the, in, in the bucket. And I, I, can prom I can tell you that since I've taken over the job, um, when I was capital director, we doubled our expenditures, our annual expenditures, from like roughly $85 million a year to $155 you know, million a year. So we're spending it as fast as we can get it. But the problem is there's only so much that the county can bond and unless they decide, unless there's an opportunity for them to do more. And we're, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, that's an opaque process. I, I'm not really part of that part of it. Thank you. Thank you.